And hello again, my friends. Today we are going to get into the achievements of China. We just talked about some of the new dynasties that have been established in this 600 to 1450 period, and let's now see what they did. Agriculture, of course, is key because agriculture is your base. You need food to survive, and then you can trade and do all sorts of other cool stuff. And in China, you had this rice. Now, we know that they had rice for a long, long time, but now they develop rice in which they have two full rice crops per year. When you've got that, you've got lots of food, and you, of course, can do other stuff. And we know that, and we've talked about it. Two rice crops per year is incredible. As a result, that's why they're going to get to that 100 million people. Now, they also use new farming techniques, and what we're talking about is using oxen and iron plows. When you have oxen and iron plows, um, you can till more land and grow more crops. You also have the development of the water pump, which allows them to move water up without just water pressure, but the idea of pumping water up. And in China, that allows them to make terraced farms. And on the right, you see there a terraced farm. You see these farms on the side of a hill in which they're able to pump water up and irrigate it. They'll also use things like water, water wheels and things like that. This on the right is a tea farm. It's absolutely gorgeous, and I love tea, so that's why it's here. And in the end, because they're growing so much tea and rice with all these great techniques, they can now commercialize it. And rice and tea become sold. There are, in many cases, the basis of taxes and will help grow wealth in general. You also have, interestingly enough, a move to urbanization in China. Um, these are just some of the major cities from back at this particular time period here. And... These cities are getting more and more sophisticated. You are getting very large cities, cities that have multi-story buildings. They actually have hotels and taverns, lots of shops, trading centers, religious centers, schools. The cities become more sophisticated, which will you know, give people places to trade, become centers of population, and it's just going to grow and grow. And of course, the big industry, we still have porcelain. And it is at this time that porcelain really reaches its finest level. Um, remember, porcelain is special because it's a special kind of clay that when you uh, put it in a kiln, the outside forms that fine layer of glass. It is typically said the Sui Tang period and the Song period, you have the greatest uh, porcelain created at any given time. These pieces today can go for thousands of dollars, and you see how sophisticated they are with dragons and flowers, and you know here we have a farming scene, and of course this will be used in the home, but will also be traded. Some other advancements that we also have going on, we have better iron, and then of course you actually have the development of steel, and steel will be important for weapons, although irons will be very important, for instance, during the uh, Song Dynasty, they were producing up to 16.5 million iron arrowheads per year. Uh, much of that just for defense, because remember we said they really weren't into military expansion at all. But really what you do have is the big advance, which is gunpowder. We talked about gunpowder before. You know it was created by the alchemists here that were looking for different type of uh, combinations. And really, they were your earliest chemists. But the first ones were basically used as kind of um, flamethrowers in which they would put it in a enclosed bamboo shaft and would have flammable material at the end, and it would spit fire. But what they ended up doing is creating these early bombs. And you see a picture on the right. This is what one of those bombs would be. They would light the wick over here, okay, use this to throw it. The wick would go in, burn, ignite the gunpowder, which would then send these little arrowheads out and just do massive, massive damage. Um, Interestingly enough, it was the Taoists who were very big into peace that created gunpowder. Um, but again, that was created as a result of them just really working on chemicals to create um, a variety of different goods. Um, 
and as you can see, devastating today. The other big thing you have is the development of printing um, with movable type. Now, we'll talk about this a lot more with Gutenberg, but with movable type, as you see down here, what you do is you set up a page of something, then you can print a bunch of those pages. However, most of the printing was done for decorative types of reasons or often for some official documents, not really in the sense of spreading knowledge or anything like that. So we definitely give the Chinese the development of the movable type, well you see here they use wood blocks, Gutenberg will use metal, and we'll talk about the differences. But this will be the basis, as I'm circling the mouse here, the basis of the modern day printing agency in the future. You also had some incredible economic changes. Uh, we have the development of what we call market economics and the idea of different markets in different areas will specialize in particular prop products. You know, you have silk over here, you'll have rice production over there, you'll have the porcelain making over here, you'll have the iron and the steel foundries in different areas. And in China, as you can see, these are some examples of Chinese trade routes from the year 600 to 1450. And all of these little things are little tiny kind of cities and villages. And you can see this is massive amounts of trade. And, and this is going to be important for China because China does help drive the trade in foreign lands, but they are so big, just like the United States, that they can keep strength and revenue in their own country by just trading with each other. Uh, we also said they developed the idea of paper money that was sometimes referred to as flying cash or bills of credit. Um, early on, it would not be controlled very well, so you'll actually get some massive economic issues and depressions because of it. But in the future, the federal government will come to control it and really dominate it, and you'll start to see the use of the development of paper money much more effectively. And we also see some massive changes in religion. And of course, the biggest intro is Buddhism. Buddhism gets into this area and spreads all over the place because of the time period at the end of the Han. Um, it was very practical. A lot of people like the idea of salvation, of course, and your own personal beliefs. Um, and then you have the spread of the work of the uh uh, bodhisattvas, which were the people that were very similar to Buddha, often considered Buddhas themselves, but those that stayed on the earth and tried to teach and instruct people. You get the building of monasteries all over the place, which would help promote religion. And then many of these Buddhists would, uh, Buddhist monasteries would actually grow crops and distribute uh, food at times of stress or drought. Um, and you also get some of a adoption of Taoist beliefs as well. You know, the uh, universal energy or the force that is initially talked about or Dharma in Buddhism, they start to kind of use the idea of the Tao as well. But then you also have the development of Chan Buddhism, which they don't really work on the writings as much, but the idea of the search for spiritual enlightenment um, many Chinese will travel to India during this time to learn more about the religion, which of course will continue to foster trade. And um, Chan Buddhism will also help to spread the idea of Mahayana Buddhism, again Mahayana, which is the belief of Buddha as a god. And that of course is a huge different than your standard or really your traditional Buddhism. But um, with the reestablishment of the Sui, and really during the Tang, uh, they do try to push out Buddhism, but Buddhism really had a tremendous impact and will be very important. And in fact, many people who worship ancestor worship will worship Buddhas as well. And you can see how huge Buddhism was. This is the largest statue of Buddha ever created in the world. This is the Great Lashan Buddha. This is 233 feet tall and was actually built. This is a real picture, gang. This was actually built to calm the waters of this river in front of it. So just by looking at this, you can see that Buddhism is tremendously impactful in China. But Confucianism will also make a rebound because Buddhism has an incredible impact on it. 
and a lot of people in China will start to adopt the Eightfold Path as kind of part of the belief in the five key relationships in that you will have um, right action, right thought, right mindfulness, things along that line, while keeping the idea of good manners and the relationships that you should have with people. And in a, in a lot of ways that this helps Confucianism grow and get reestablished by adopting some of these ideas of Buddhism. And Confucianism gets a little uh, more theoretical in the idea of speculative philosophy, like the idea of Plato's forms or kind of the idea of studying karma and things along that line. All of these things Things become incredibly influential that changes Confucianism to the point where it starts to be adopted a little bit more. And so as you can see, this is a vibrant period in which lots of things are getting done. China is really expanding itself and it's going to become a superpower in the world. Remember your questions, remember your comments, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.